Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us at the Cambridge Union's Great Industry Debate, a collaboration between us and Alliance of Independent Events Management Agents and Trident Hospitality. Uh, my name is Christopher George. I have the honour of being the president of this, the world's oldest debating society. The union was founded in 1815 as a space for students to debate the greatest issues of our time. It continues to do so today, bringing leaders and students alike to challenge and be challenged by one another. Just to let you know, this debate will be recorded, so if you do make a speech, um, let us know if you do not want it to appear on the internet. Um, just send us an email and we'll make sure that is edited out. The motion before the House tonight is, this House believes the UK is failing and would go international. The way this debate will work is that we'll have six brilliant speakers, three from each side. They each have around 10 minutes to put forward their case. But don't worry, there's plenty of time for you, the audience, to get involved and have your say. During a speech, you can stand up and say, point of information, if you wish to make a comment or ask the speaker a question. These are typically around 30 seconds long. An important note is that speakers do not have to accept your point of information. If they do so, then you may continue to speak. If not, I ask you to sit back down and let them carry on. There are also floor speeches, which at set times start the debate, which I will indicate when we get to them. I'll ask you to raise your hand if you want to make to speak in proposition, opposition, or abstention of the motion. These speeches are around two minutes long, and when you make one of these speeches, please state your name and your organization. There are also prizes available for the best floor speech. So before I introduce my first speaker, I would like to thank our sponsors for this event, the University Arms, the Graduate Cambridge, and the Fellows House. Our first speaker this evening is Michael Dominguez. Michael is an award-winning hospitality veteran and president of ALHI. Michael, you have the floor. Hi, uh, good evening everybody and thank you. This is uh, quite an honor and uh, thank you for the invite uh, to be here. Uh, I look around and I'm like, okay, so what's the American doing here in this conversation? Uh, th there's a lot that I think we can learn from mistakes and where we were in the United States just about 15 to 20 years ago. And why am I saying that? You know, the, the old adage is very simple. To deal with a problem, you first have to admit you have one. And sometimes when we're in a place and we were there at one time, we're so sometimes arrogant about how we see ourselves and how we visualize ourselves, and we're so insular, we forget that the world is a very big place. And there is a lot of narratives that are being driven that are way outside your purview and way outside your control. So you cannot ignore that, and you cannot ignore what that means for the future. So what, what am I talking about? In the United States, the years between 2000 and 2010 were known as the lost decade. It was a decade where domestic outbound travel outpaced international inbound travel for 10 consecutive years. We were the only country in the world that lost international audiences. And you know why? Because we thought everybody would come. We thought we're the United States, and we didn't need to do anything more. Uh, fast forward, we started something called the Meetings Means Business Community, and that was an organization of uniting our industry, because unfortunately, we have a lot in our industry, and it's a lot of noise that doesn't get heard. Because we're all talking, but we're talking to ourselves instead of uniting that argument and uniting the voice and saying, this is how we move it forward. How do we get governments to pay attention to us? How do we get, in our case, the White House and the administration to understand what we need to be doing as an industry and why is it good for the government and the administration to understand that? Well, 2009, our president was President Obama uh, in the middle of the recession. It was actually September of 2008. And we always say the greatest moment for the US travel industry was the moment that President Obama says, you cannot take your private planes and fly to Las Vegas. And we lost 100 million in cancellations within six weeks in Las Vegas of meetings and events because of his words. Why was it the greatest day? Because we realized we were flat-footed, we weren't prepared, we didn't know how to talk about our industry in terms that the government cares about. What's our contribution to jobs? What's our contribution to GDP? Why should it matter to you that that statement was an ignorant statement? By the way, President Obama ended up being one of our biggest supporters because we had to educate him on how big we were. We were bigger than the auto industry. We didn't know that in the United States. We didn't know that because we had never done an economic impact study. We had never said, this is what we mean to the overall economy. This is what we mean to GDP. You cannot get complacent on what you think you know. We know how important it is. We know what that looks like, but our government officials don't. 
And unfortunately, the biggest challenge we have is government changes too often. So right when we've gotten somebody educated, they are gone. And we get to do this all over again. Fast forward to literally just this past six weeks, we passed an ominous bill in, in the United States that for the first time has established a secretary of tra travel and tourism in the United States. We have a secretary position now sitting in the White House in the cabinet. That has never happened. I don't think it exists here. And by the way, it's needed. It took us 20 years to get that. That is my point. This is a long haul, and if you don't get there quickly, unfortunately, you will be playing catch-up for decades. I don't think you're completely there yet. You're teetering on it. You are literally on the verge of saying, how do we make sure we do not become complacent and people will continue to pick this as a destination and not go international? There is a lot of competition out there. And probably the one, the one of the worst things you can do is to think that there isn't competition out there. There are a lot of choices, there are a lot of options, and the people that are doing it the best um, literally are thinking about the experience, they're thinking about the investment, and they have all the support of the governments behind them. That's the important part. And if you're gonna talk to governments, unfortunately, you know what they care about? Jobs and the economy. So you need to talk in those points, even though we tend to talk about the emotional part of the meetings and events industry. But what is in the news matters. And I can tell you most probably the, the hardest thing that you're going to find are the people that are reading the news specifically across the pond. And I will speak to uh, my fellow Americans that don't really pay attention to global news except for headlines. So when they see headlines that your ambulance response is the slowest they've seen in a long time, they start to worry that I'm going to take a group to the country and all of a sudden, what happens if I have an emergency? What happens if one of my attendees needs medical assistance? What does that mean? Reality and perception, two different things. Unfortunately, the perception around today is being driven by headlines. And what we have found is most people don't take the time to read below a headline. They read the headline, they move on, and unfortunately, that becomes the narrative. What is the narrative? UK is a mess. Uh, I actually made the joke when I came on this trip, I got to watch the news and I was watching the BBC and I said, I actually felt good. You guys are a little more messed up than the United States at the moment. <laughs> I really did. I got some comfort watching the chaos here, <laughs> knowing that it's not just us. But the interesting part is when it came, comes to travel and tourism, we have our act together. We have the attention of the White House. We have the attention of the administration. We have the attention and a game plan on how are we going to attack our elected officials. And what do I mean by that? You know what we used to always tell everybody? We need you to write your local representative. We need you to talk to them. You know, we learned, no, we don't need you doing that. Um, in the United States, we have 400, 400 plus Congress uh, men and women. We need the 150 that care about tourism to understand what our issues are. We're never going to get everybody else. But what we found out, and this is politics uh, 101, and this is politics through history, we need the people to stop legislation, not necessarily to move it. We need those 150 people to squash things that are going to be really bad for us. But that took us starting to speak with one united voice. And just like in any election, we all have our talking points. We all have a campaign, and we're all saying the same thing. That is going to be so necessary for, for you to be moving forward. You know what the narrative is about the UK as well right now? Your economy is behind everybody else's. The e further behind the EU, well behind the United States, because we literally opened up fully a little bit ahead, and we are running. And you haven't even factored in that Brexit and that settlement was right before a pandemic, and you're still trying to figure that out. Trade partners are changing. Geopolitical situations are changing. And the UK looks a little flat-footed right now. As I said, perception is not necessarily reality, but the perception will drive a realistic approach to people visiting, wanting to visit, visit and not wanting the chaos. You know what people want today? We live in an on-demand society. I can get what I want, where I want, and how I want it. And I want it smooth. You know what we remember about the travel to the UK right now? Heathrow Airport about six months ago. Because the media does a great job of telling us when bags are lined up for days, they never come back to tell us it's been fixed. And that's the narrative that still exists. You know what everybody has asked me since I've traveled here? How was your experience at Heathrow? Why are you asking? Is it a problem? <laughs> because normally people don't ask me, how was your experience at the airport? Because it's an issue. You know it's an issue. The people traveling know it's an issue. 
That's going to be a problem when you think about where do I want to be? And there is a lot of discretionary spend today. There's a lot of discretionary choices. And there are a lot of areas that are doing a lot of good work to make sure they know it's simple. Uh, I just spoke recently at a Dubai conference. And I was uh, speaking at our table today. And you know what was interesting? Dubai gets it. They worry about the experience from the moment you arrive at the airport to the transportation getting to and from to your experience at the hotel and how the whole destination flows as a tourism and visitors destination. We don't tend to do that very well in the US and I know you don't do that very well in the UK. You, you make us fend for ourselves and you hope it, it all works and works well and smooth and right now, when is, what is in the news as well? I don't know what's working and what's smooth because what day and who is striking today? <laughs> that is the narrative. That is a very hard dynamic to try to figure out when you're a traveler and it's uneasy and you know what the decision becomes? I'll just go somewhere else until it settles down. But the problem is I never hear that it settles down. And that becomes a narrative that you lose one after another and you start to lose years. And the years can turn into decades. I don't mean that to be depressing. I mean that to be an initiating argument to say you got to get moving. And you've got to start thinking of the destination as a whole. When I was in Dubai, I actually told them, I was on a panel, I said, you are the first destination outside of Las Vegas that I know that understands what the mission is when it comes to this experience. When you come to Vegas, that's the thought process. It's the thought process of how you get there. Airport is literally right off the strip. You can get there very simply. They just have the first tunnel uh, that was built by Tesla that moves you into the convention center to different parts of the convention center so you don't have to walk. That is thinking through an experience. Why are they doing that? Because that's your competition today. Dubai is a competitor today for the dollar. When we were in Vegas, I was the chief sales officer at MGM Resorts for seven years. The one thing we always talked about, I want your share of wallet. You're going to spend so much money when you travel. You're going to spend so much money visiting. Uh, and we always like it. You know, it's the OPM, other people's money. We like that in our destinations. You should like that in your destination. And to be able to do that, I would not take lightly the risk that you are at right now. Your country is dysfunctional in a lot of different areas at the moment. That's not critical, it's reality. It's finding itself. It's very clunky at the moment. A lot of that has to do with geopolitical situations. Some of it has to do with pandemic. Some of it literally has to do with trying to find our way and understanding who we are. And I think you run a risk if that all who you are is who you've been in the past. Realize the competition is heavy, it's everywhere. Most of what you have today is not unique except your people, but your people need to get together if it's gonna survive it. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Michael. We're now gonna to turn to our first speaker on the opposition, Rachel Boriston. Rachel is the head. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> You're too popular. Um, the head, Rachel is the head of Destination UK, London and Partners. She's a passionate promoter of London and works to bring real value to clients across industries. Rachel, you have the floor. Thank you. And actually, thank you, Michael, for that argument, because it leads really well into what I'm going to explain to you about how I feel um, that I can oppose this argument. Firstly, though, I just want to address what we mean by the term failure, because to me, failure is an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to improve. I'm in disagreement with the suggestion that the UK is failing, but I do absolutely acknowledge that we are in a transitional period with problems, as you've addressed. We're not quite there. We're not there where the US was in that decade of no business. We've got an opportunity to change. Yes, our politics are a mess. The cost of living is concerning. Train strikes are inconvenient, and we're all still recovering from the decimation of COVID, and hotel prices are at an all-time high. I'm just going to put it out there. But when I say these sentences, do you think exclusively of the UK? Can you not think of any other international destinations that are also suffering from the same or similar, with even greater issues that pose a threat to your booking decisions? Horrific human rights laws, corrupt governments, lack of infrastructure, sky-high hotel rooms and minibars. Yes, I'm looking at you, Las Vegas. <laughs> what I implore you to do is to... I'm just going to carry on with this because I've got time. Um, what I implore you to do is just to reframe your perspective of the UK. I know it's hard. The mainstream media has catastrophized every challenge that we've encountered of late. We see a barrage from the media of sensationalist clickbait headlines perpetuating hyperbolic narratives of disarray, of chaos at airports, a government in crisis. 
this information is out there for us to encounter every day and we all feel the squeeze and yes it's hard I'm not denying that it's hard our clients are asking for more for less in reaction but this information is out there internationally and yet London saw leisure and business visitors return to only less than 15 percent than the 2019 numbers and that's without the major market of China if it's good enough for an international audience for international event planners why is it not good enough for us the UK is an aspirational destination. London is ranked in the top 10 of ICA ratings alongside multiple articles about the top places to visit in the UK, not just London, but Manchester and the Scottish Highlands featured in the National Geographic as the top places to go for culture and nature respectively. These are published daily, bucket list items, world heritage sites to visit, the statistics, the visitors, the feedback, the support, the major events that we host all support this. So why then are we ready to turn our back on the UK and all it has to offer? Who has culture like ours? Who has history like ours? Who has innovation and industry sector leading expertise like us? Who has globally renowned educational institutions? We are stood here today debating this in Cambridge. Cambridge University. This attracts global awe and appreciation, global prestige. Would this have the same impact if we were debating this in a hotel room in Paris or a convention hall in New Orleans? I don't think so. And that brings me to experience value. That's what we offer. That's why I argue that we're not failing. That's where our opportunity lies. Mm -hmm. And we know when we bring people together for business events, yes, ultimately it is to do business, but more so it's to connect and to share experience. We know the world is changing and as our delegates change, the value of experience becomes ever more important. And what a multi multifaceted experience that you can curate with the UK as your backdrop. Perhaps the issue here is not that the UK is failing, but perhaps we as an industry, as a collective industry, are failing the UK. But remember, as I said earlier, let's use the term failure as a positive, an opportunity to learn and to do things differently and to improve, a catalyst for change. Let's turn to our UK convention bureaus and our tourism boards and visit Britain and get beneath the surface of the UK to see it anew and to explore creative ways to collaborate to get the best from our destination. It's on us as well, me as a London Convention Bureau, as a Destination Bureau. We could be doing much better, I admit that. But when we're asking for budget, when we're asking the government to support us, we need statistics, we need facts, we need money, we need to show our hand and we need to say people want to come here, we need to invest to make it the best experience that we can. Let's keep the momentum of We Make Events over COVID. Let's support the business of events and UK events and the work that they can continue to do at this critical time. Why would we have to take our events overseas when we've got the opportunity now to shout about the value of our industry and invest in the UK? Change is on the horizon. If anything, now is time to invest in the UK and push for change. Business events absolutely underpin economic growth. Now more than ever, don't we need to invest? Don't we need to be part of that and elicit change and progress? Let's not let the phrase of you don't know what it's got till, you've, till it's gone ring true of our industry and the infrastructure for business events here in the UK. Use it or lose it. I'm not saying that other destinations don't hold merit. I'm not saying that another international destination might be better placed for some of your client events. But if you're looking to tap into sector expertise, culture, innovation, creat creativity, then the UK is absolutely up there as a leading destination and should continue to be considered as such, despite the challenges that we face at the moment in time. It depends, I suppose, on what the purpose of your event is and the, value that, the values that resonate with you. So perhaps you're looking for sustainability, but the UK has a 10-point plan for a green industrial rev revolution. Glasgow is one of the leading re sustainable destinations, as are Brighton, Leeds, Bristol. Connectivity. Well, actually, the business of events did a study and from the UK agency sentiment, it was that connectivity and accessibility was one of the most important factors when choosing your destination. Are we not one of the most connect well connected destinations of the UK? Do we not have six major national, um, national airports in and around London and also the Eurostar, which has 19 journeys throughout, the, throughout Europe connecting the UK to Europe? Perhaps it's a variety of experience. Well, what do you and your delegates want to do? Perhaps you'd like to learn to row with the coach of the Cambridge-Oxford boat race. Well, you can do that here. Maybe you'd like to surf the largest man-made wave. Well, you can do that in Bristol. Maybe you'd like to tackle the largest mountain, if you wish, in Scotland. That's what you can do here. Or zip line along the longest zip line in Europe, in North Wales. Dance where the Beatles began in Liverpool. Need I go on? Need I say any more of these experiences that you can curate here in, London, in the UK? We offer a multicultural welcome with over 250 languages spoken in London. That cultural influence along, amongst boroughs welcomes people from around the world, boasting diversity and inclusivity. 
perhaps you'd like variety of product. Maybe you'd like to dine in a UNESCO World Heritage Site or party in a graffiti-laden vault. From the historic to the cutting edge, the UK offers so much to choose from. And as for hotels, you can have the bougie to the budget. It really depends on what you're looking for. London and Loan saw a rise of 52,000 bedrooms over the last year, with more on the horizon. We've got a Raffles coming. We've got a Peninsula coming. There's constant investment and innovation in this country. So why are we not using it? Why are we not embracing it? And when we think of value or sector expertise, the UK as a whole ranks fifth on the Global Innovation Index. London has the most tech unicorns outside Silicon Valley and is fourth in the world for tech venture. We're leaders in healthcare with EASL, a global association conference for the study of the liver for 8,000 global participants. They chose London and they're coming back after their success. The UK is the third global hub for life sciences. I would go on, but I fear for my 10 minute slot. So let's think also about the value of major events and how that weaves into your experience when you come here. We've got Eurovision in Liverpool, we had the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, we've had the Female World Cup, Major League Baseball for the first time in its history is coming outside of the US, it's coming to the UK. Also we've got ABBA Voyage and who doesn't love a bit of ABBA? <laughs> so how can a destination with all of this opportunity, with all of this prestige and all of this potential be considered to be failing? Let's not let the UK fa fail. Let's remind ourselves of all that makes it a wonderful destination and let's remember how an experience in the UK can make you feel. Let's refresh our perspective and see the, and see the UK through fresh eyes and let's not be so bloody British about it by focusing on the negatives, but start focusing on all that is good and valuable and worthwhile. And let's adopt our stiff upper lip and pull together and get through this difficult transitional time as one united industry. Yes, we have our challenges, but no, we are not failing. And I implore you to continue to bring your business to the UK and be part of the change. Thank you very much, Rachel. We're now gonna go back to our main speakers. So our third speaker and our second for the proposition is Joss Croft. Joss is the CEO of UK Inbound, an award-winning trade association that advocates and lobbies for policies that drive the UK's second largest service export sector. Joss, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, President, as well. Uh, well, I've spent uh, 30 years of my working life promoting the UK. Uh, as a destination for tourists, but also a destination for trade, for exports, and for investment. So I find this rather refreshing, taking a slightly different view. Um, because, of course, the UK, you're quite right, the UK is a wonderful destination to visit. Absolutely fantastic for leisure or for business. Some of the best culture, I think, you reference. The strongest heritage, no doubt. Land of creativity, beautiful countryside, amazing service and venues. All true, all true. But of course, it's very easy to say that as an English person sat here in Cambridge today and to take that from a very insular perspective, because I think a global perspective might lead you to a different conclusion. Uh, Italy, not short on a bit of heritage. France, pretty good culture the last time I looked. Innovation, South Korea, Japan, they're not doing too badly, are they? Switzerland or Norway, they might have a view in terms of their countryside credentials as well. And for good service, has anyone here been to Thailand recently? Because that's what good service really is. And yet, and yet, we're still the sixth most visited country in the world. We're on everyone's bucket list. And uh, to the gentleman from Vietnam's point, absolutely, heritage is a huge draw for people, but it's also a double-edged sword. Given that people think that we've been here for 1,000 years, 2,000 years, they think we'll be here for 2,000 more, so it doesn't incentivize them to travel immediately. They're off this year to take their event to Vietnam or to Vienna. And sometimes it's those perceived weaknesses that are actually uh, are based around low expectations that are so easy to over-deliver on. It rains more in Venice and Rome and Nice than it does in London. The food undoubtedly is better in the UK than it is in France. And the people are certainly a lot more friendly than they thought we were. But we're lucky if we understand, if, we, if people overseas understand what the UK is. Are we England? Are we Britain? Are we London? Are we the British Isles? Frankly, people just don't know. And the views of the UK are shaped very much by London as that central force that it is. To so such an extent that people still believe that we have smogs, that we wear bowler hats, and that Scotland is really only just a short distance from the industrial Victorian heritage that we have in the north of England as well. 
But of course, if Japan has four main islands, and I don't know who in this room, and someone will correct me uh, if you could name all four of those, then how can we expect Japanese visitors to know what Wales is or what Wales are? <laughs> and again, let's take an external view on how people perceive the UK. Out of a ranking that the World Economic Forum did on price competitiveness on the United Kingdom, and in fact over 140 countries, can you imagine where the UK came on that price competitiveness agenda? 140th. It's that good, bringing your event to the UK. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about something I call DILO, and you have to be a little bit careful saying that, uh, but it stands for the day in the life of. So you, your event is coming to the UK. You didn't get any subvention like Singapore would have given to you. You didn't get a video from the Prime Minister like France would have done for you. Um, the venue didn't give you a discount on the venue hire because the venue isn't owned by the local authority. It's owned by a pension fund overseas. So you're coming to your event here in the UK. Well, first thing, you need a visa. Um, you'll have to go to a visa application center, probably a seven-hour flight from where you are in China, bringing your family. You all have to go for your biometrics. And you have to fill out those forms. Are they in Mandarin? Nah, they're in English. Cost of a visa. Ten-year visa from China for the States, $155. Two-year visa to the UK, £350. And of course, a Schengen visa, if you decide to go to Europe, that gets you 26 countries in one go. And that's if you get the visa, because of course, whilst you're applying for the visa, you have to hand over your passport, so you can't do any travel in the time that it takes for you to get your passport back. Running at 13 weeks in India this year, it took you less than a week to get a visa to go to Schengen this year. So where do you think the agents are promoting? Where are they selling? Where do they know you'll be able to go? Well, it ain't in the UK. And of course, if you're European now, uh, 22 miles across uh, the Dover Straits, well, nowadays, you can't travel on that ID card that gets you to travel through 26 other countries. You have to pay £100, please, to come to the UK to buy a passport. But after that, it's all all right. You're on your way. But of course, you've got the highest rate of air passenger duty pretty much anywhere in the world. We'll gouge you for that. Of course, you arrive, queues at the border. Border force, they're on strike. There's no priority lane like there is in Shanghai or Vienna for your business event. There's no city branding like there is in Barcelona or Dublin. Of course, you have to wait two hours for your luggage as well, if you're lucky to get it, of course, because the ground handlers are on strike. Uh, good luck if you're getting to your venue by train, because uh, they're on strike as well. Uh, and even if they're not on strike, uh, you probably do what most people do in most international cities, is you pitch up at the station thinking you'll buy a day trip or an overnight trip to Manchester, well, you'll need a second mortgage for that one as well. Uh, and of course, if your train happens to uh, just be slightly late because they're different train companies, there's no interconnectivity, so you've missed your connection. So again, good luck with that. Good God forbid that you fall ill, or in fact, you fall very ill and need an ambulance, because that ain't coming very time soon. And the VAT on your hotel, well, that's the highest that it is in any country in Europe outside Denmark. So it's expensive coming to the UK. But of course, that's if you can get the accommodation, because a lot of the accommodation stock here in the UK, and people talk about 10 to 20 to 30% of that accommodation stock, has now been taken over by government contracts for visas, uh, for, for, for refugees and asylum seekers. And indeed, now we're here this week for hospital discharges as well. And think about the economic impact that that has on that destination. And of course, there is remaining hotel stock, but because there's less of it, the price has all gone up and there's now less available as well. And of course, your shoppers are here over here, they're maybe gonna business extend, they're gonna do some great things in London, but that VAT, 20%, you can't even reclaim that now. But you could do if you went to Madrid, you could do if you went to Paris as well. So why is this? Well, it hasn't happened overnight, and it's, becoming, uh, and it's been coming incrementally. And all because the decisions that are taken that impact inbound tourism into the UK are taken without account of inbound tourism into the UK. So first and foremost, why is that? Well, international visitors don't vote. Who cares? Um, and we saw that, actually, with the travel restrictions during COVID, that if you're a Brit, then good for you. Uh, you could uh, uh, do your uh, uh, testing in country. But if you're an international visitor, testing in country means you might get trapped here. So you simply weren't going to travel. It's very much of a hidden export. It's actually our second largest service export. It's our fifth largest export sector. It's bigger than automotive. It's bigger 
um, uh, uh, than oil exports out of the United Kingdom as well. But I don't think the government fully understands that each person that comes to this country and spends £700 contributes to that fifth largest export industry as well. And the government thinks people are going to come anyway. And again, a, a great point from one of the speakers that, that we just saw from the floor that we heard as well. Um, you know, uh, we have this uh, uh, kind of very insular view that uh, people are just going to come anyway. Hey, we're the UK, we're fantastic, but our competitors are eating our lunch. They are out there spending us, outspending us massively in terms of the promotion to the UK as well. So most of the decisions that affect inbound tourism, whether that be leisure or business, are sat in other government departments from the one in which tourism nominally sits. Transport sits in transport, visas sit in the Home Office, VAT sits in the Treasury. So we just don't get that fair crack of the whip. And we're too fragmented as an industry as well. There are too many trade associations. And, you know, all the trade associations, associations do, as far as the government is concerned, is they complain. They never come up with costed solutions. We don't evaluate the impacts of our events industry in the way that Treasury does to demonstrate that incremental value, the export value, the placemaking impacts that our events have here as well. And of course, those links, you come here for an event, you're more likely to invest in the United Kingdom, you're more likely to send your children to be ed educated here, and you're much more likely to buy British as well. And politicians just don't understand tourism. Um, they, uh, obviously, they get hospitality because they like pubs, clubs, bars, casinos and restaurants, but they don't understand that supply chain of the agents, the intermediaries that we have in the room that bring so much value to our industry and our economy as well. Now, we do have a tourism minister, and it was fascinating, and I was making notes from what you were saying, actually. Uh, we have a tourism minister here, uh, and he's very good, but he's a junior minister of state. He's not a cabinet position. He doesn't just look after tourism, he looks after civil society, arts, heritage and sport. And he's also in a soft department, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. Now, I've been working in inbound tourism in a long period of time, but over the past 10 years, I have seen three tourism ministers in Scotland, and that's over 10 years. And what that's allowed us to do with the Scottish Government as the industry is to build up trust and to build up knowledge in amongst those key decision makers. In the past 10 years, uh, in Westminster, we have had 13 tourism ministers. We do not get the chance for them to understand or to trust what we're saying. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to speak collaboratively. We need to speak with one voice. Now, on the leisure side, we have had some success with that. I work very closely with Outbound as well as other agencies, and we do find areas of commonality, and we work as one team on that. Obviously, we have our differences. Uh, outbound, they're very interested in foreign office uh, guidance. I'm very interested in visas, and there's no crossover in between the two. We need to secure that cabinet position for a tourism minister, or at the very least for that minister to have convening powers across the whole of Whitehall to make sure that decisions that are taken outside DCMS, uh, tourism is taken into account. We need a proper economic strategy for tourism that spans across the whole of the government as well. And we really need to say what the industry needs, how much it's going to cost, and being absolutely clear what government will get from it. But it's not going to come quickly. It's going to take time. It must be done. But in the meantime, for your events, I do propose that the UK is failing and that we should go international. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn to our fourth speaker and the second for the opposition, Philip Greer. Philip is the commercial director for the University Arms and he's worked in the hospitality industry for over a decade. Philip, you have the floor. I was kind of a last recruit to this, uh, this debate this evening. Um, so I've been really giving it some thought. Um, basically, a, a colleague couldn't attend, uh, and I got the call to ask if I would step up. And, and I was very happy to, without kind of really realising what I was buying into. Um, but it's been really interesting this evening listening to, to both sides of the argument, in particular the proposition. I think that you, the kind of argument you, you've both said is that our industry needs more government support. And, and, and from that, I don't think I disagree. I definitely don't disagree. Uh, but when, I've, when I came on board, I started thinking about this proposition and started, I kind of broke it down into two parts. 
The first part being, this House believes the UK is failing. So politically, I would agree. Um, inflation, industrial action, disappearing PMs, which PM is it today? Uh, a royal family at war with itself, uh, the media tearing itself apart. It would definitely appear that the UK is on a slippery slope uh, and we're not sure which way it's going. But is our industry failing? Is the hospitality and events industry failing? To that, I would say absolutely not. Since 2020, our industry has been on a roller coaster. We didn't know which way it was going. Most of us in, who work in the industry started 2020 in a great place. It looked like it was going to be a fantastic year. Then March happened and everything went south. We didn't know which way we were going. And it went that way for about 18 months. Then Omicron at the end of 2021. Does everyone remember Omicron? That lasted until January. That was last year. That was this time last year we were struggling with Omicron. We can't remember that Omicron happened in 2022 because 2022 ran away with itself. From March onwards, we were all just exhausted. The phones were ringing, the emails were coming in. We didn't have the right staff. Uh, so when it got to December, we needed that Christmas break. So we came out of COVID and we came into um, the next problem, which was a problem we kind of caused ourselves, which people have mentioned already. Brexit, COVID, recruitment challenges, right? This is hospitality. This was the first industry people wanted to get out of. Unfortunately, it's an industry that you've got to love to want to work in it. If you want to work in event management, if you want to work in hospitality, you've got to be the right person. You've got to have a thick skin. You've got to be passionate about it. And you've got to want to work weekends sometimes. That doesn't necessarily always happen. I like to think we're turning that around. It feels so much better now than it did a year ago. Kitchens feel fuller. Touch wood. I hope this is wood. Um, housekeeping teams seem like they're getting there. We can open everything that we want to sell. We've got people in the office to answer the phones. Resp uh, inquiries are being responded to, maybe not within two hours, but maybe within four. So it feels like we're on, on the right way. So 2022 started terribly, but by the end of it, I think we needed that break, and this year feels so much better. I have a nervous optimism about 2023. We have other things now to be scared of. Is there a recession looming? What's the cost of, energy, uh, cost of living crisis going to do? Is the energy situation going to put people out of business? Is it going to put us out of business? Um, it all depends on, on, on the next few months, really, and, and what those people in Whitehall think. However, if we go back to events and if we go back to the events industry, it feels like they're being delivered successfully. In the UK, within our properties, within my hotel, I feel like we're getting things done. It might be getting done through gritted teeth, it might be down to the wire, and we might all be crying at the end of the day, but we've got it done, the customer hasn't noticed, and hopefully they're giving us good feedback. Are we failing? No, I think we're learning. Uh, we're growing, we're improving, and for the most part, I think we're all kind of loving it again. The second part of the motion is, I would rather go international and would rather go international. I see the attraction here again. Um, I regularly attend international events as part of my role. Uh, sometimes some, some perks to the job. I've lived and worked overseas. But let me tell you, everyone gets dietary requirements wrong. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you're a vegetarian in the south of France, you learn never trust an eclair. There's probably fish in it. Um, <laughs> Whilst an international trip can feel exciting, it can feel new. If you're booking outbound, if you're booking for Brits, you're going to have the, the problems that, that Josh just mentioned. You're going to have visa challenges. You're going to have, where are my people going? Who's meeting and greeting them? How am I getting them there? How's that working? Who's my DMC? All of that stuff. But think about what the UK has to offer. It's unique. You're never going to have the same experience twice. There's so much on offer. If you just think about Cambridge, if you just think about where we are here now, how many of us who don't go to the university, have been to an event in, in a debating chamber before? I'd say probably none. This is an incredible experience, and it's here, it's available. But just thinking about Cambridge away from the university and not even thinking about the colleges, you can head out to Saffron Walden and you can try uh, English sparkling wine, which rivals champagne, and it really does. I'm not just saying that because I sell this place. You can make your own gin in the Cambridge Gin Laboratory. Now, I know that they, they're, they're doing so well with their own marketing and their own sales that you can probably get a Cambridge Gin and Tonic in Whistler in Canada, but can you make a bottle of it yourself there? No, you can't. So you come here, you learn about it, you make a bottle, you take it home. Cambridge is also, was also voted the number one city in the UK as per Condé Nast. The UK has so much more to offer. 
If you look further afield in the UK, think about Wales. I used to live in Wales, I used to live in Cardiff. Can you imagine taking clients to watch the Welsh international rugby team and hear them sing Land of Our Fathers? There's nothing like it. It brings a tear to even an Englishman's eye. Drive, uh, driving experience at Silverstone. There are plenty of places in the world, I'm sure, where you can do a Grand Prix test track, but Silverstone is there. It also now has a hotel and conference center on site, so you can combine it with your incentive. Or head out to Liverpool. Uh, my colleague here has just mentioned about doing a Beatles tour in Liverpool, um, but why wouldn't you? I won't even touch on London and everything London has to offer. There's so much to do here. British produce. This is a big passion of mine, and I'm not just going to plug uh, East Anglia. I'm a proud Norfolk boy, but the products that we have here are the best, some of the best in the world. Uh, the cuisine that we have on offer, the fresh products that are coming through is just incredible. We've mentioned sustainability and we've mentioned rail strikes, and I know that the two go hand in hand, but keeping a business in the UK does allow for a greener path to travel. Um, most venues in the UK now are running with a green accreditation. This is really important for us, and it also helps companies with their corporate social responsibility. And if you're thinking, I still want to go to Paris, I still want to take my, my company event to France, fine. Go through the Eurostar and spend two nights in London, stay at the St. Pancras Renaissance or the Standard. Keep some of it in the UK. So coming back to my opening comment where I was a last, uh, a last minute addition uh, to this, I feel like that is an example of how our industry works in the UK. We know each other. This industry is built on relationships. We trust each other. We know that we can pick up the phone to each other and say, I need this. Can you help me with it? Of course we can. That's who we are. We work together. We're passionate about our, our industry. If one of my colleagues who's an event booker inquires with me but doesn't, doesn't place the business with me, I still want to know they win that business because that's more money staying in the industry. They're getting that commission. They're keeping people on their payroll. They're keeping the economy going. It's very important. We know we can rely on each other and we can trust each other, and that's why we've rebounded from COVID, and that's why we've done so well. For me, the UK events industry is far from failing. In fact, I think it's enjoying a wonderful new beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn to our final speaker for the proposition, which is Hamish Reid. Hamish is part of the senior leadership team at MMGY Hills Balfour. He also heads up European market activity for Dubai business events. Hamish, you have the floor. Well, I have the, uh, the honour of trying... Sorry? English water. English water, thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's undrinkable. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it was Cambridge gin, it would be drinkable, sir. Um, so I have the uh, enviable task, I suppose, or our unenviable task of wrapping up what both of these gentlemen have said. And I'm trying to, I've been taking notes furiously, trying to, to work that out, because we were very prepared. We obviously sat down at about eight minutes before we came in here to, to, to work out which either party was saying. Um, as the president just, uh, just mentioned, I work for a company which specialises in taking business overseas. I've been doing that for 30 years. Joss and I have been sparring for 30 years. Um, and that's what I do. And I also... Sorry, Rachel. I, I, I read somewhere that you're meant to address the chair as a point of order. <laughs> um, and, we also, and we also do work uh, and promote the UK. Um, and indeed do Cambridge's PR. <laughs> so, um, just, uh, just to point that out as well. But it's what I specialise in. I work in, a, uh, in the business events side of things, and I also do, as Mike has uh, beautifully, kindly pointed out, I also work for, for Dubai and I'm their European manager. Um, so I've got to try and wrap up what these two guys have said and try and do that in a succinct way. Um, the debate proposition, which was that the UK is failing and would rather go international. Sir, you mentioned Prince Harry. Um, it sounds like that was his um, the title of his book that he, he, should, have, he should have chosen. Um, but of course, we're here in Cambridge, not Sussex, so we know it's Duke we are supporting. Um, 
The opposition, no, you are not failing at all. As hoteliers, and sir, we haven't heard Steve speak, um, but uh, you are not failing. The, the, the support you give the industry, Philip, what you've just said, absolutely, you're not failing. Rachel, well, Rachel used to work with me, so she's, <laughs> she's got all the skeletons that I, I'm not going to share, so you're brilliant. Everything, everything you have said is absolutely perfect. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe a Venn diagram. Um, some of us uh, went to school, Chris. Um, school is where children go and get educated. Um, and I'm going to talk about three circles of that Venn diagram, all interlinked with that little bit in the mi middle where all three interlink, and that is the bit called failure. So circle one, circle one is the supposed value of the industry. Mike referred to, they did in the US, they did a valuation of the industry. Our valuation, if you want to Google it now and put me on the spot, like Rachel just did a minute ago, but if you want to Google it, Events UK say that the value of the events industry is £70 billion. Pounds. Cities Restart, who use tourism economics, part of Oxford Economics, and I do apologise for mentioning the other place. Um, they say this figure will have increased by 2026 to 27.6 billion. From 70 billion to 27.6 billion. So this is a problem. The value of the industry is not established. And we need to work on establishing the value of the industry. Am I allowed to ask a question of the floor, President? You don't, can't necessarily ask for a response, but you can ask okay. the one. Hands up. I'll ask a question of the floor, and if you want to respond, please do. <laughs> um, I should have checked that when we were having dinner. Um, <laughs> hands up if you think that Glastonbury is a music festival. Glastonbury, you know, where everybody plays pop songs and sings. Okay. Keep your hands up if you think it is a business event. Okay, so the ones who kept their hands up thinking Glastonbury is a business event, you are part of the 70 billion. Those who put their hands down think it's part of the 27.6 billion. Oh, and by the way, that's the 2026 figure, because in 2019 it was only 19.4 billion. But I've made, you know, the point I'm trying to make is there is a confusion as to what the value of the industry is. And why is this important? Well, circle two in my little Venn diagram is government support. And getting government support comes with something that Mike mentioned, and I think it was something as well that Joss mentioned, votes and taxes. And we're not able to succinctly make and create and understand what the value is. Therefore, when we go to government and say, hi, we're worth 70 billion, and they go, oh, that's a lot of money. You're worth more than Tesco's. Who's your largest employer? Oh, we don't know that. <laughs> that. That's detail, but we think we're worth 70 billion. So we've got to get that figure right to get the government support. And Mike and Rachel both mentioned points about convention centres. Sorry, no, it was Joss who mentioned a point about convention centres not being owned by the government, being owned by... And then Rachel mentioned New Orleans, which is the Ernest N. Memorial Convention Centre, which is owned by the state of Louisiana. It's publicly owned. The problem we have in this country, and my apologies to... Harrogate and SECC in Glasgow, but Keith Barron from Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi owns Excel in London. AMS from Los Angeles, financed by Deutsche Bank, owns Olympia. Blackstone, I believe is a Chicago-based private equity company, owns the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. So, one of the things that gets talked about a lot in our sector is the legacy of events. It was mentioned earlier. Well, how can we make an argument about creating a legacy of events? Because it's going to be good for the community and good for the, you know, the people, the voters, etc., in that area. And ask for that convention centre, reduce their rates for five years' time. Because they have a legitimate reason to want to make profit. But here, 
It's almost a unique problem in the UK. It's our major convention centres and our major exhibition centres are owned by overseas companies. Whereas in America, and I work, whilst I principally work on Dubai, my company works with a lot of American companies, a lot of Asian companies, a lot of European destinations. You can have a, contact, a con, um, um, conversation with the Messe in Hamburg, and it is owned by the council. It is owned by the government. So you are able to have conversations at a government level. So government support isn't just subvention. It isn't just budget. It's also a fundamental roots all the way down that we need to get government engaged in our industry. S Joss, you mentioned DCMS, which stands for Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Thank you. Are events part of digital? Are they part of culture? Are they part of media? Or are they part of sport? Or are we just part of the and? <laughs> I feel we're not part of any of those. But this joke about this affects the psychology. Because I said, in Europe and elsewhere, trade shows are part of government thinking. And they really aren't here. And the relevance to wider society. I would say, and I'm going to credit, this, this, this comment comes from, a, from a, a gentleman called Phil Saw, who now runs a company called Closer Still Media, but used to run Blenheim, used to run UBM, which are powerhouses in the exhibition centre. And he says, we think the government is indifferent. They aren't indifferent, it's that they don't even know we exist. And that brings me on to circle three. But before I go to circle three, just one thing about the UK, because this is where an area we're not failing. If you look at the talent in the events industry in the UK, and I just mentioned Closer Still, I can mention Informer, I can mention Reed, the world's not relative, I wish they were, but um, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, so I'd be on a yacht. Um, um, they are the world's powerhouses in organising events and they are all based in the UK. Even Little Imex in our sector, based in Brighton. But they organise their events in Las Vegas and Frankfurt. They organise their events around the world. They don't organise them here. So that's why I believe the UK is failing. We have the talent, we have the commercial nows, but for some reason, they're not taking place here. Anyway, circle three, and this is where I sort of wrap up. And this is an attack on us. This is an attack on us. As, as members of industry associations, Joss mentioned it, we have too many. You might think I'm foolhardy to stick my neck out on this. Tonight is being organised by the AIEA, an industry association. But in their credit, they don't have people building empires uh, or coveting industry invites and awards. They just get on and do what they're doing. So um, forgive me for my attack. It's not on, not on you guys at all. Um, um, but simply put, there are too many. We have an alphabet soup. We have the EMA, the Missing in Action MIA, the HBAA, sorry, B-E-A-M, which letters don't stand for business events and meetings. It stands for BEAM. We have the AEO, the AEV, the ESSA, the EIEIO <laughs> may have made that up, but we have over 30 industry associations that I know of, and I've been bored of it for like 15, 20 years. Um, if you're an accountant, you become a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. If you're a surgeon, you become a member of the Royal College of Surgeons. Please conclude. Um, if, <laughs> if you're... <laughs> If you're a doctor, you become a member of the British Medical Council. We have lots and lots and lots of these different associations. We even tried during the pandemic to merge them all into one called One Industry, One Voice, or O-I-O-V, which is probably... <laughs> um, but the trouble was nobody could decide which voice should be the one that was going to be heard. But it's a serious point because without it... Um, our message is diluted, and both Mike and Josh referred to that earlier, and it's a very, very important message. Because if we don't engage government, industry doesn't get the support it deserves. Um, sir, I'm just going to... Uh, Kevin, you, you mentioned a point earlier about it's immoral to go abroad. 
There's a Mark Twain quote, which uh, I often use. Um, Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. People should travel. You learn by traveling. So the three circles, the Venn diagram, are interlinked. You get the facts about financial value correct. You get a trusted one voice, one association. And then you get government support. By being a trusted voice, we get heard. By being heard, we then matter. Because what matters, as I said earlier, is jobs, is votes, is tax. And if we get the government support, visit Britain, London and Partners, Rachel, Scotland, Wales, all of our towns and cities across the UK will get the support they need and actually what they deserve and what the private sector deserves. Because the VAT that is taken by the government from this sector is certainly not put back into the sector, but it will be if we make the right arguments. But until then, and only then, will the UK events, uh, the UK events industry not be in danger of failing itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamish. Um, we're now going to turn to our final speaker of the evening, Steve Jones. Steve is chair of the Meetings Industry Association and managing director of Wybston Lakes. Steve, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Just before I start, if any of you have had the pleasure of working with Bedfordshire Borough Council at any point in your life, you will have your blood run cold as mine did when the thought of them running conference centres in any shape, way or form. So, uh, yeah, let's try and leave that to the professionals. Um, now, we've heard some impassioned speeches this evening from both sides of the House. And as the last speaker for the opposition, indeed the last speaker of the evening, I'd like to explain why I so vehemently disagree with the proposition. Having been born, raised and lived in the UK for all my life, I've seen the usual cycles of the economy, along with the changing governments, um, their new agendas, focuses, political biases, the good times, the bad times, and in fact, the best and the worst of times. I've also travelled the world, sorry again, um, and I've seen firsthand how we fare as a nation, how we're regarded as a people, how our facilities, service levels, pricing, and our all-round offerings compare and contrast. Working in the events industry for 30 years, I feel I've earned the right to speak authoritatively on this subject and to argue the motion that the UK is failing and that events would sooner go international just doesn't hold water. I think the bar is set far too high for that to be true. I accept, I even agree that we have problems right now with high inflation, a compressed labour market, political instability, striking workers and even a member of the royal family thinking the Jerry Springer show is back in town. <laughs> but to say we're failing... But to say we're failing in a more global economy um, with high inflation around the world, a world that's still recovering from COVID, a world that's seen war on the continent of Europe, civil wars, terrorist insurgencies, political unrest um, and several continents feels a stretch too far. The UK has hosted several global events of late, such as COP26, the Women's Euros and the Eurovision Song Contest we mentioned earlier, um, and scheduled for next year, Aberdeen's announced to host the International Council for Nurses. Just a few examples of those choosing to place their events with us. And here in Cambridge, you know, over the next year or so, confirmed events include the International Seed Testing Association, International Medicine for Sustainable Future, International Microelectronics Assembly Packaging Society, International Association of Music, I could go on, but I sense I'm losing you, um, totaling over 10,000 bed nights, with a further four events under embargo, totaling another 11, 000, 1,100 sorry, delegates and more bed nights. And that's just a snapshot in one small percentage of one city, just one of 76 cities in our great nation. That's before we talk about events taking place in our towns and out-of-town venues, in purpose-built exhibition centres, convention halls, sports stadiums, dedicated facilities, and those just off a road, such as the one I operate. Let alone the hundreds of thousands of events taking place in, day in, day out, in hotels and other generalist venues. Uh, it's also noteworthy that Amex Travel recently listed both London and Manchester in the top five destinations in the world to hold events, adding further weight to this argument. And I don't see my client base jumping on the first plane they can find to take their events international, quite the opposite. With record business on the books, with strong rates being achieved, we're delivering events and we stand up there with the best in the world. 
clients are bringing international delegates, not just down to the quality of our events venues, but down to the safety and security of the UK. The transport infrastructures, including the trains, um, our, um, our laws covering health and safety, bribery act, data protection, are not just the laws themselves, but the way we interpret and implement them. We complain vehemently about red tape, but I think we get the balance very well between implementing it um, and having it wrap itself around our necks. With Visit Britain forecasting 35 million visits in 2023, that eight, that's been 86% of the 2019 level and 18% higher than it was last year, with a £29.5 billion pound spend, which is 4% up on 2019 um, and 14% higher than last year, the facts don't stack up with the motion. Would they rather go international, really? As if so, why haven't they? The travel bans are lifted, the low-cost routes are flying again, yet the UK events market is in good health. I attest this is down to the reason I've given and more, as our businesses and corporations are fo focused on the triple bottom line, putting profits on an equal footing with our people and the planet. Our employment laws are up there with the best in the world, and those booking events in the UK now know that the team planning, organising, serving, serving and managing their events will be treated fairly. And with our rich, diverse, multicultural population, we've shown that we'll welcome people from anywhere to our great nation. And with, the UK sustainab uh, with sustainability being on the lips of all blue chip companies, to know the UK's focus on improving its already considerable efforts uh, towards sustainability gives confidence to bookers and delegates alike. More so, the UK is renowned for its culture, its institutions, be this Welsh lamb, Scotch and Northern Irish whisky, our universities, the monarchy, our police service, the armed forces and the NHS. This is why a country that ranks 80th in league for land mass at only 0.16% of the total land in the world can boast the sixth largest economy, with a GDP approaching three trillion US dollars. Now, I'm not arguing that the UK is the best destination in the world on all metrics, sitting at the top of every chart, leading the way in all of these areas, or that it's alone and other countries don't offer similar propositions. I am, however, arguing, as I set, it, as I set out of the off, to say the UK is failing is a step too far. Yeah, and the bar has been set too high. Yes, we have our challenges. Yes, we can keep doing more to improve, but failing we're not. And events would, to say events would rather go internationally simply doesn't ring true. Thank you. Here we vote as we have for the past 200 years with our feet. At the end of the room, there are three doors. The middle one is the abstentions. To the right, you have the eyes, which means you agree, and to the left, the nose. So a reminder that the motion is, this house believes the UK is failing and would rather go international. So when I say when, everyone is free to go and start voting. But again, can we thank our speakers once more? Thank you very much. <laughs>